Isn't it amazing that you're not here to hear what I have to say or what I think, but you're here to receive from the riches of God's Word. I'm glad Bonisi thinks that's amazing. If you have your Bibles, please would you turn with me to Acts chapter 21. Is it okay if I stand here and not on the stage on top? Guys at the back, thumbs up. But before I jump into the scripture, I just want to read an excerpt from a book uh, that I'm reading called Why I'm Still Surprised by the Power of the Spirit. At the end of the church service, there were 40 of us on the healing team laying our hands on people and asking God to heal their physical maladies. My newest disciple, a beaming gung-ho young man in his 20s who had converted to Christ just two months earlier, prayed with me for a single woman in her early 20s. We prayed earnestly. The young woman cried softly and nothing happened. Then the young man whispered to me, ask her if she thinks God won't heal her because of the abortion she had when she was 18. My first thought was, you ask her. Although he was a brand new Christian, he had demonstrated an accurate prophetic gift. I sighed. Forgive me if this question is too invasive, I said to the young woman. For we think that God may be telling us that you think he won't heal you because of an abortion you had when you were 18. He cried. It was true. This kind of story became normal for me because in my new church, we no longer went to church only to sing and hear a sermon. What were you expecting as you came for church this morning? Were you looking forward to singing some great songs, hearing a stimulating talk, getting more than your share of the mandazis? I haven't been eating mandazis for the last few weeks, so I know. Drinking some chai, catching up with your friends. And is that it? Is that your expectation of what it means for the people of God to gather in the presence of God? Or is there more to it than this? Wonderfully, this morning we've had such an incredible time of singing and hearing of God giving dreams and speaking to people. And actually, when, when we turn to the Bible, when we turn into this book of Acts that we'll be reading this morning, we see that actually it's, it's, it, the church is not just a gathering of people who meet around an, an organized agenda, but it's the meeting of a radically transformed community empowered by the Spirit of God. See, when, when the book of Acts starts, we see the resurrected Jesus, resurrected unexpectedly for his disciples, speaking to his disciples and telling them to wait in Jerusalem for what the Father, what, what God had promised through the ancient prophets. That there was this promise that he would pour out, he would send the Holy Spirit, and that when, when the Holy Spirit had arrived, they would receive power and would become witnesses to this incredible event of, of Jesus' resurrection, not only where they were in their locality, but right to the ends of the earth. And the book of Acts unfolds this story. This is exactly what happens in the next chapter. We see that these disciples were gathered. They were, they were sitting together. And then suddenly there was a sound as of a mighty rushing wind that came and tongues as of fire appeared on their heads. And then they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit empowered them. And in the ensuing confusion and excitement, Peter stood up. And he had to explain that, no, no, this is what the prophet Joel spoke of hundreds of years ago when, when he said that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, on, on everyone. 
It will no longer be for a select few. I'm, I'm pouring it out on old and young. I'm, I'm pouring it out on, on men and women. I'm pouring it out on rich and poor. And, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions and dream dreams. Old men, Timo said, hallelujah. And from that time, the story of the church, as we sang that the flame was lit, has been of, of God lighting the fire by His Spirit in one locality after the other for the last 2,000 years. And one tribe, we are privileged to be part of that continuing story. And so I ask you, What's your expectation as we gather together as a community? I say, ah, Cephas, that sounds, that sounds inspiring. That sounds exciting. I, I can tell that you want us to raise our expectation, but what else? Well, not only do I want us to expect that God would do in our community, in our day, what we see him doing in the pages of the New Testament, but that you would trust and expect God to do it through you. You see, it's not a, it's not a case of, yeah, we're going to gather Timor will be strumming. He's going to be crying and telling us about his dreams. Then his sister will come up and they're kind of a family act and man is going to be pumping. But actually, God, I'm expecting that we'll meet with you as we gather together as your people and you want to do it through me. That God, I, we expect you to speak. We expect you to do the impossible. We expect you to save. And Lord, here I am. Please do it through me. This morning, we're going to jump back into the book of Acts. We've been going through it for some time now. And uh, we're coming to the tail end with titled the series, the, To the Ends of the Earth, with the vision of what Jesus spoke of and how we see the story unfolding. And this morning, I want us to jump into the story with this lens of raising our expectation, but not just raising our expectation, but also trusting God to raise our contribution to our gatherings. And I want to zero in on a particular area that is hearing God's voice together and for one another, which we can call the prophetic. And so if you're wondering where, where is this message heading, it's, it's heading to us raising our expectation and trusting God to raise your contribution to hearing God's voice together and for one another when we meet together. Let's start in verse 1. It says, When we had parted, and NIV says, torn ourselves from them and had set sail. So we're jumping into our story as Paul is on the return leg of this third tour of preaching the gospel in the ancient Mediterranean world. In his first tour, he kind of went into what was called Asia Minor, uh, which is in modern day Turkey. And then in his second tour, he, he went into Europe uh, in Greece uh, kind of area. And then his third tour, he was based in what was then uh, uh, the province of Asia, but now we, co we call it uh, Western Turkey. And uh, he was based in a city called Ephesus for about three years. And then he, he felt uh, laid on his heart to do a collection uh, for the believers in uh, Judea, in kind of Israel area. And so he began traveling through the churches. He had been particularly in Europe, and he was uh, uh, doing this collection, but he was also writing many of the letters we have in our epistles. And now he's on his way back, and on his way back, he passes again through uh, the province of Asia, and he meets with the elders of the church in Ephesus. 
And then he, as he's meeting with them, he, he tells them that he feels that the Holy Spirit is leading him to Jerusalem, but he doesn't know what awaits him. But in every city, he hears that actually there's going to be imprisonment, there are going to be hardships, and it's very likely that they're never going to see him again. And so it's quite an emotional time, and they uh, uh, hug each other, they kneel down, they pray, uh, and it's a lengthy uh, kind of goodbye. And then we, we join in uh, in that story there, he's, he's on his way to Jerusalem. We ran a straight course to Koz. And then the next day to Rhodes and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we came inside of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And so that bit of scripture just explains his journey from kind of southwestern Turkey and Mediterranean and to what we'll call modern day Lebanon. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey, while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home again. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea, and entering the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, The will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and started on our way up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us, taking us to Manasseh of Cyprus, a disciple of long-standing with whom we're to lodge. So we're talking about hearing God's voice together as a community and for one another. And what I'm challenging us this morning is to raise our expectation that more and more we'll see God doing this among us. And not only that, but would also raise our contribution that He would do it through me. He would do it through you as an individual. But as we come into this story, the first thing I want us to notice is the atmosphere the environment in which the early church, the early disciples heard God's, God's voice together. And isn't it incredible that we see it, it, it was in a corporate and loving environment. Now, we must be clear that this story is focusing on Paul's resolve, kind of like Jesus, when Jesus set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. And, and Paul is following in the footsteps of his master to say he is ready to suffer whatever, if it is in accordance with God's will. But even within that story, we are struck by the communal nature of the early church's faith. We, we are struck by their deep love for one another. And friends, if we are to grow in this expectation and to grow in our contribution, it must be in a community that is intimate and loves one another. And this is my, my first point. See, Paul, if you are familiar with the story of the New Testament, Paul was a gifted guy. He had met the, the risen Lord Jesus in Acts chapter 9. Jesus had told him what lay ahead, what plans he had for his life. Elsewhere, in some of his letters, we see he had incredible 
Revelation, he says he was caught up in the seventh heaven and, and he heard and saw things that are not allowed to be spoken. If anyone could hear God for themselves and kind of do this Christian life solo, it would have been Paul. If there could have been any Christian who was kind of self-contained and self-sufficient on a mission, I know what I'm called to, I know why I'm here and, and I'm doing it on my own, it would have been Paul. But rather than finding a man who is set in individualism and set on saying, hey, I'm doing this thing alone, we find a man who is deeply integrated in community. Even though he's on this mission to Jerusalem and he knows there are many things uh, that are awaiting him, in each place that he stops, Paul, the first thing that he wants to do is, is to find a local community of believers. Paul wasn't the one who had planted these churches or, or, or preached the gospel to these people, but he still felt a kinship. He, he spent as much time as he could with them. Not only did he spend time with them, he, he was literally doing life with them. He, he shared his life. He opened up his life. They, they spoke into his life. He wasn't kind of like, I am the man of God. I am the man with the power of the hour. I am the man who's been to the seventh heaven. You guys listen to me. But he's open for them to, to speak into his life, to encourage him. And I want to ask you this morning, how, how open are you to doing life with the community of the people of God? How, how open are you to having brothers and sisters speaking into the most intimate parts of your life? You see, in, in our age, it's very easy to kind of do this Christian life solo. Yeah, you, you do come for church, but your life is ring fenced. You kind of have your podcasts during the week. You've got your speakers that you're listening to, your YouTube channels that you're following, your, your TikTok. You've got your Spotify playlist of worship music. You've got Maverick and Elevation and City Alight. You've got your Bible, your rhythm of devotional life. And listen, in, in the big city, you can't, you can't trust anybody. You see, because the hustlers who are out hustling Monday to Saturday on the streets of Nairobi are uh, in church on Sunday morning. And so you, you don't know who to trust. In fact, some of the churches are being led by con men. Now there's a story that came out this week of allegedly one pastor from Kitui who was shot in an armed robbery kind of a pastor by day, and thinking, hey, nighttime is when you're going out to save the world. It's like, no, no, nighttime. It's criminal activity, and you're like, does that surprise Nairobians? No. No, no. Because in this Canairo, you can't trust anybody. Dear yeah, friends, if, if we're to cultivate hearing God's voice together, this is not optional. In fact, Paul says it is the priority. In one of his letters in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, pursue love. And that's after writing one of the most beautiful chapters on love that we normally read at weddings and so forth. But it wasn't written for marriage or for weddings. It was written for the church. And it's in the middle of talking about how to exercise and how to handle spiritual gifts. And in the middle, it's sandwiched this, this beautiful piece of love. And then he says, pursue love. And 
earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you prophesy. It's not kind of an add-on. Actually, it's the priority. We're to cultivate an intimate and loving community. We were to grow in hearing God's voice together. You might ask, okay, how, how can I personally respond to this? What can I do? Well, firstly, what we see in this passage is that church must not simply be a Sunday thing. Paul, whenever he arrived, he's, he's kind of not thinking, hey, we'll see each other on Sunday. <laughs> Immediately, he's looking for community. Is it kind of like Bon Voyage until next Sunday? I'm, I'm, I'm doing this thing alone and then we'll meet next time. Secondly, we, we see the believers practice hospitality with one another. We see these believers opening up their homes to Paul in, in one place it stays for seven days. With Philip, he, he stays for an undisclosed period of time. And Philip who's called the evangelist, we, we meet him first in Acts chapter 6. And one of his mates, Stephen, was killed in Acts chapter 7. And guess what? Paul was there, called Saul, approving of this death. And then Philip had to flee from Jerusalem because Paul, a.k.a. Saul, was breathing murderous threats and going from house to house, dragging men and women into prison. And then Philip, on a roundabout way, ends up in Caesarea. Yet he's this incredible forgiveness. He's let bygones be bygones. He's received them. Like, no, no, I, I, can, I can do life with a kikuyu. Man, what happened in 2007? We can't trust those other guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to open my life to this group of people. But man, you, 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 you can't trust, you can't open your life to people in this section of society. These church brothers can't be trusted. We see them praying with and for one another. And it, it just wasn't kind of like adults, whole families. One of the most impactful things in my early Christian life was being welcomed into homes and families as a single young man who came from a broken home. Not only do they pray with and for one another, they cultivate a deep concern for each other's lives. See, it wasn't just a case of, hey, Paul, you do you and let me do me. But they expressed that they deeply cared for what would happen to Paul. They, they deeply cared. Like, no, no, church people are so nosy. Why do you want to know what's happening in my business? Why do you want to know who I'm dating? Why, why, why do you want to know where I live? For, for some people, it's, it's like where you live is a state secret. Why, why, why do you want to know what's happening in my sex life? What business of that is yours? My friends, if we were to cultivate this loving and intimate community, we must cultivate a con deep concern for each other's lives. And this is why it's important for every single one triber everyone who can hear my voice this morning to be in a life group. Not just to be in a life group. You know, kind of, I'm, I'm on the life group, WhatsApp group. I, I blue tick the messages. <laughs> but to be an active part, to, to show up, to open your homes, to rotate being in one, to do meals together. And in fact, life group is the perfect place for you to cultivate the spiritual gifts because you're among a people who know you, who love you, and 
You can do it in the security of kind of if, whatever, if you're unsure. You're not going to be judged. You're going to be helped. But not just that you receive incredible encouragement in your life. I remember I've shared this story before. Um, about a year and a half ago, we were applying for our visa here. I'm from Zimbabwe, for those who don't know. And I was really unsure whether we were going to get it. It was just after elections. You know, things were up in the air. And I had started to make plans in my mind to say, okay, if this thing doesn't work out here, we are going to go to this place. How are we going to do? How are we going to move? And it kind of, it's, it's a big decision when you have to move countries. And I, haven't, I hadn't even spoken to my wife, but I was thinking about it. And then I got a text early the following morning. I, I'd been thinking about it for a couple of days. And it was from my life group leader at the time, Reno. And he said, hey, Sivas, I, I was just praying for you. And I felt I got this word, you are where I want you to be. I thought, man, this is incredible. It was just one line. But it was so impactful. I, I thought, I haven't even spoken to my wife. And it gave me such a peace. And I said, Lord, if that's what you're saying, then I'm, I'm giving it up to you. And two years later, here I am. But it was in the context of a loving community where somebody cares enough for me to pray for me. And friends, that's what you get when you join a life group. But it also brings me to the next point that any child of God can contribute in this way. You see, what we get in our text is, it wasn't just a specific church. Yeah, we know there are churches that are kind of spirit churches. It just wasn't a specific individual. In fact, Entire, it says that they, in plural, were, were all encouraging Paul by the Spirit. It wasn't just a specific gender. We hear of Philip having four daughters who prophesied. It wasn't even just a specific age. In fact, you might find it strange that they said virgin daughters. They're, they're not necessarily talking about their sexual experience. What they're saying is that they were not married. They, were, they must have been young perhaps under the age of 18. And four of them who, when it says they prophesied, it means that they regularly and habitually prophesied. God was using different people in different places. Paul says, listen, in every city where I've been going, this is the message that has been coming to me. It's like it, it, all the cities, all the churches that they planted, all these groups of believers were active in the prophetic. And friends, this means that any child of God can contribute in this way. Any one of us. In fact, the Bible says each one of us is given a spiritual gift time and time again. Any one of us can contribute in this way. A couple of weeks ago, um, I was leading the first service meeting and it was time to send the kids out. But I also wanted to encourage people to bring words of encouragement. I wanted to, to do it before the kids went out because a couple of weeks prior, my kids were talking about a prophetic word that was given during the meeting. And I was like, what? You guys listen to that? <laughs> you actually pay attention? And so I thought, yeah, it would be great for the kids to be here. And then, lo and behold, my daughter comes up, who is 10, saying she wants to share a verse. And so I let her share. But here I was thinking that, okay, it'll be nice for the kids to stay in and listen. Maybe they might benefit a little. And what Scripture says is that your sons and your daughters will prophesy. You see, because there's, there's no adult Holy Spirit. Samuel first began to hear the voice of God as a little boy. And in fact, what I found is that my kids often have more incredible spiritual perception than I do. 
simply because their, mo- their minds are not clouded with so many other things. And there's just a, a purity with which they come. And it, it astounds and amazes me. And so won't, won't you do it some more, Lord? Lord, you, you said our sons and our daughters would prophesy. And here we are. You said this, this, this is for you and for your children. And so, Lord, this is what we're asking for. And hey, I'm, I'm not married. I'm a woman. I'm single. Kind of seems like the people up front are all married. They look a bit old. No offense. Can, can I contribute? Can I really get up and stand up and, and say something? Can God really use me to, to encourage somebody? Yes. Not only can he, but he wants to. He, the beauty about coming to the Bible is that we're not bringing our thoughts into it. We are looking to the Bible to see God's thought coming to us. It's, it's God's idea when we sing, He is Savior. That's not my idea. That's not the band's idea. That's not the songwriter's idea. That's God's idea. It's His revelation that I'm the God who saves. And when He says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, old men will dream dreams. And when we respond, we're not kind of imposing ourselves. We're not being presumptuous. But we're coming in faith. You might say, yeah, yeah. See, first, I, I agree with you. And that's why I'm open to the prophetic. I'm, I'm open to being used of God. I'm available. I'm, I'm willing to try it out. But what Scripture is saying is not, don't be just open. Don't be just available. Don't be just willing to try it out. What Scripture says is earnestly desire. Be eager for the spiritual gifts. And, and that word desire can mean to set one's heart on. Be deeply committed to something. To have a deep concern for. In a negative sense, it can be used for coveting and, and being jealous. It's, it's, it's like a fire. And so God wants a people who are not simply saying we are open, Lord, we are, we are available, but God, we are, we are like Jacob who says, I won't let go of you until you bless me and blessing me is using me in this way for the blessing of your people. See, that's why Jesus said, ask and keep on asking, knock and keep on knocking, seek and keep on seeking. That's why in, in, in Scripture, we have these stories of, of this woman with an issue of blood who is unclean, but who presses through the crowd and says, I'm, nothing is going to keep me. I'm going to grab a hold of Jesus' garment. This is why we've got the story of blind Bartimaeus, who when he's crying out and people are telling, telling him, be quiet, he cries out all the more. We've got the story of the Canaanite woman who comes and argues with Jesus. Why? Because God loves faith. In fact, the Bible says it's impossible to please God except through faith. And what faith means is that we diligently seek Him because we know He's a rewarder of people who diligently seek Him. It means we're we're not kind of just open, we're not passive, but we're pressing through. And so friends, when when I talk about raising your expectation, raising your contribution, I'm not talking about saying, hey, I'm I'm here, I'm open, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll be willing to say a prayer for it. I'll I'll be, if if God comes and and tells me something, yeah, I think I'll be. It's (laughs) earnestly desire. The prayers of Hannah, who prayed to God and sounded like she was drunk. And perhaps you're here and you're thinking, yeah, Cephas, what you're saying sounds exciting, but it also sounds quite dangerous. 
You see, we've, we've seen much harm done by quote-unquote prophets in the name of the prophetic. We've seen people manipulated, taken advantage of. We, we've seen heresy preached and lies peddled in the name of prophecy. We've seen people abused and some actually die in cults all because they thought they were hearing the voice of God. Isn't it much safer to stick here with our Bibles and just kind of concentrate on what the Bible is saying and not experiment with trying to hear the voice of God? And I would agree with you that this can be quite dangerous in the wrong hands and it needs to be handled with care. I would agree with you 100% to say, let's stick to reading our Bibles. But friends, if we are really reading our Bibles, we cannot help but not settle for anything less. Because it is the scripture that says, I will pour out my spirit and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. We, we can't simply ignore certain sections of the Bible and ring fence them as dangerous. See, the, the answer to abuse is not to stop use, but right use. And friends, this is what we're striving for as a church. And the Bible gives us helpful guidelines as we handle the prophetic. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, 22, Paul says, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances. And what he's saying is, hey, don't look down upon the prophetic. Don't be like, oh yeah, that's just, that's Sean. You know, when he gets up, he's kind of an enthusiastic guy. Yeah, let's, we'll, 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 we'll kind of endure him. We'll give him his time. Then let's carry on with our program. No, no, I say, don't despise prophecy. But what must we do if we're not to despise it? Because frankly speaking, there are certain models that are worthy of being rejected. He says, actually examine everything carefully. Don't, don't just listen without any discernment all the men of God said, this is the season of a thousandfold harvest. You know, why come up and tell, show people graphs to say, hey guys, these are our expenses and our uh, incoming, you know, we want to try and do this. No, 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 this is, your, your, this is the season of a thousandfold reaping. And if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. Bring your, your whole savings, life savings. Because the Lord is saying that the blessing, the, the, the billion shilling blessing, the, the window is just open now. There's like a, a portal that is open in heaven. And this is the sh billion shilling blessing. And, uh, hey, I want that billion shilling blessing. Like, where's the discernment? How does that measure up to scripture? How, how does that measure up to the character and the nature of God? How does that measure up to the practice of the church throughout the ages? See, friends, this is what it means to examine everything. And frankly speaking, there's some things that you examine very quickly and see that this is nothing but dross. It, it's not worth our time. But there are times when we examine and we say, this sounds like it could be the voice of God speaking to us. And friends, we also need to hold these words lightly because Paul says we see in part and we know in part. And, and we see it in this text. Agabus, who is a, the only kind of renowned prophet, we, we've seen him sharing prophetic words. He comes and he says, thus saith the Holy Spirit, in this way will the Jews bind up the man to whom this belt belongs and hand him over to the Romans. But actually, when you follow the story, that's not exactly how it happens. 
The Jews don't bind Paul. They are beating him and trying to kill him. They don't hand him over to the Romans, so to say. The Romans must come and rescue Paul forcefully by force of arms. And so even Agabus, who is this New Testament prophet, he kind of sees in part. And when we're handling prophecy, there's, there's this aspect of revelation, what God shows us. There's this aspect of interpretation, how, how we are to interpret that revelation. And then there's this aspect of application. Once, once we've interpreted, once we think it means this, what are we to do? And you kind of see this at play. Some of the disciples thought, hey, God is showing us that this is going to happen to Paul. And so it must mean that Paul must not go to Jerusalem. And that's what they say to him. But Paul in his maturity is aware that actually, yeah, God, what's being revealed is right. What's being interpreted that suffering is ahead is right. But the application, that, that's not quite right because Jesus had already spoken to him and said, listen, you're going to suffer many things for the gospel. And so when we receive prophetic words, we must be aware that in the revelation, somebody can miss it. Even in the interpretation, we can miss it. And even in the application. And so we hold it lightly. We don't despise prophecy, but we are aware that in any of these areas, and so when a prophetic word comes to you personally, or if you're giving a prophetic word, you're not coming to tell somebody what to do. Thus said the Lord, you shall marry that woman. Hallelujah. Okay. All right. Maybe it's been shown to you in a dream that I will marry that lady. Maybe it's right. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not talking specifically about marriage. Maybe it's talking about something else. And maybe the application it's not that I should speak to her. I'll just, I'll just wait. If God says I'm going to marry her, then God will make it happen. And so there, there are nuances when we receive words as a church. That's why as, as elders, we, we listen to them, we discuss them, we pray over them. Because we understand that we know in part and we see in part. But what it means is not we, we say, hey, let, let's just do away with prophecy. You said Liverpool are going to win the league. There's no way that's going to happen. Let's just stop prophesying in this church. And neither do we kind of put you on a pedestal and say, oh man, when, when Cephas speaks, it is the voice of God. He is the man of God. I remember as I close watching Scone TV. Uh, which was TB Joshua's kind of TV. And they're this advert when they started and they would show these picture frames and they would have names of prophets from the Bible, like Ezekiel, Isaiah. And then in the last frame, they've got TB Joshua. It's like, no, 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 that's, that's not the way it works. We are not on that level. We know in part, we see in part. We hear God's voice together as a community and we weigh it together as a community. Why don't we stand together? My challenge, my encouragement, my aim this morning was that you would raise your expectation for our gatherings, for we are the people of God in the presence of God. But not only do we have a great God among us, but God has distributed his gifts to each one of us who have put our trust in Christ. And he, he wants to speak through you. And so will you trust him to raise your contribution you don't have to become weird all of a sudden. You don't have to look super spiritual and serious all of a sudden. No, no, just as you are, just in your voice, just with your personality. You might not have the same gift as Jess. Yeah, that's her gift. But don't despise your gifting just because it's different to somebody else's. When, when Makanaka came, my daughter to share, she was going to share John 3, 16. 
I could have said to her, hey, Makanaka, you know, that's a nice verse. It's in every Gideon's Bible, in almost every language. Just, just hold it for now. But as a dad, I was like, wow, this is amazing. How much more is your father in heaven looking at you as you take those baby steps? Sometimes you fall. It's like, wow, this is amazing. You, you speak to somebody and you say, hey, this, this might not connect. You speak and you ask, does that connect? They're like, no. Like, oh. But your father in heaven is like, this is amazing. What incredible faith and courage to step out. And I, I love our meeting this morning because what we're saying is there's only one superstar in this story. There is only one hero. There's only one man who is worthy to say, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And that's Jesus. And so in this church, we're not, we're not looking for superstar prophesiers. No, no, no. We are looking for children of God who will trust Him. Who will say, Lord, I'm not going to be passive. I'm going to seek and keep on seeking. I'm going to ask and keep on asking. I'm going to knock and keep on knocking because I know you're a good father. Amen.